Good morning, Internet. Welcome back to the uh, beautiful Chromeworks control room in uh, Ottawa, Ontario, a very rainy Ottawa, Ontario. It's a really miserable day out here. I don't know how it is where you guys are. Um, so we've got a fun game lined up for today. I'm actually really excited about it. Um, it's a brand new original game that um, that I put together. Well, I kind of conceived of it, started putting it together, handed it over to Jeffrey. He did a good chunk of the coding and then handed it back to me again. And so that's where we are on this thing. It's, um, it's a, a fun little game and it all started with uh, me looking at a website with, that um, creates mazes automatically. And it got me thinking, hmm. I wonder if I can turn these uh, mazes into a video game. And so I just started saying, okay, so I'm trying to go through the maze from one side to the other, but um, how am I gonna uh, turn it into a competitive game, right? You could time yourself going through the maze, but that's kind of boring. And I thought, okay, what if you're competing against someone to go through the maze? And the next thought was, okay, well, it's, are, are both players moving in the same direction, racing through the maze? Well, they're just going to be copying each other. What if they both start on opposite sides of the maze and try to meet each other? Well, the problem then is um, how can the two players influence each other? So then I started thinking about ways that you guys could sabotage each other as you were going through the maze. And then we started inventing all kinds of fun power-ups that you you can do. So the idea is that you always have the ability to really mess up your opponent's player. You're, uh, first of all, as soon as you touch each other, boom, you both get reset. You get, so uh, if you feel like your opponent's closer to the may, end of the maze than you are, you just have to touch them and it sends them right back to the beginning again. And then there's all kinds of other power-ups that people can use to mess each other up. Uh, I'm really interested in what kind of strategies um, evolve as you guys play this. It's going to be a um, two-player um, seated simultaneously game, which means, so it's not online, it's just um, one player is using WASD and the other one's using arrow keys and you're just navigating through the maze. I uh, tried to keep the controls nice and simple, so um, in order to uh, move, uh, in order to trigger any of these powers, some of them sit in your inventory until you want to use them, and so instead of... Um, having to reach for another button, what I did was I made it so that you can double click on any of the directional buttons to trigger certain powers. So if you want to drop a bomb, for example, you can um, you can like double click on the down arrow button instead of just holding down the arrow button to move and that will make something happen. Anyway, a fun little game. Um, it's, uh, I having looked at the code and just the complexity of it and the sheer amount i've got like 15 pages of documentation here i'm realizing that this is just not going to work a couple of times i've tried with you guys to do super super um, big games on saturday mornings and it's just not working so we're going to break this into two parts what we're going to do today is get our characters moving around get the maze working properly and get um, um, a couple of other preliminary things done and we'll get our um, our power-up our power up spawning, but we're not going to activate our power-ups until next week. And so we're going to do a part two lesson next week where we activate our power-ups and, um, and we do all the various things that we're going to do to mess each other up. Let's see who's online today. I don't see anyone chatting with me over on um, YouTube. Someone say hello if you're there because um, I don't see anyone chatting there and I can't tell who's online. Meanwhile, on Discord, it's very busy today. I have Chris Copeman here today. Good morning, Chris. Uh, Gamer Davies here. Uh, Dex here. Kian's here. And Thane are here. All the regular victims are here. And I'm pretty sure that it's actually working now. I did a lot of playing around with the, um, with the sound settings. And I've got a new set of headphones again today. And I think that you guys that you guys on YouTube should be hearing the conversation on Discord now. Um, can someone on Discord just could chime in and say hello so we can double check that? Who's listening? Hello. Hello, Chris. How are you? And hi, Derek. Okay. So um, you guys on YouTube, if anyone... Hello. Hi, Thane. So if anyone on YouTube, um, if you can hear the conversation on Discord, I just want to do a little last minute confirmation and make sure everything's cool. Um, okay, so let's get going. I've got some remixes I'm going to show you later, but um, for now, let's get into the game. And um, as I said, I, we will not finish today, but we're going to get something that will let you navigate the maze and both of you basically like time yourself through it. 
from there, you can go ahead and um, and remix this game if you want to, right? You can just turn it into a, some kind of a maze running game. We're going to do the collision with the wall, so you'll be able to navigate through this maze, uh, both players at the end of this. And you'll have basically a game, but there won't be any power-ups, is my point. Okay, so let's get going here. I'll go over to my live screen. I am not hearing from anyone on YouTube. Um, I'm just wondering whether YouTube is... Um, I'm just concerned with whether I'm even streaming here or not because the people on Discord are watching this via another stream. Is anyone on Discord watching this on YouTube too? Is it all good? I, I'm... I'm... You are, and it's I'm watching all... it on both. I'm on both. Okay, and it is it, the live stream is running anyway, right? So we're good with Happy. that. It, what do you mean? You're not watching it, or you're not, or you can't see it, or I don't know what you're saying. All right. Anyway, so okay, so Jeffrey has just come over to say I'm up live. It's one of these rare mornings where Jeffrey's actually awake for my live stream, so um, he might uh, chime in a little bit later yeah, with some help. Yeah, I woke up at uh, 6 p.m. yesterday. Yeah, Jeffrey woke up at 6 p.m. yesterday. Well, this is like total teenager behavior. So he's been up all night, and now he's just trying to, he, he doesn't know what to do, so he's probably just going to stay up all day and then try to get to bed at a reasonable hour. This is what happens when you're a teenager and you don't have to get up in the morning. You just keep sleeping in a little later every day, every day, until your day suddenly disappears. Man, okay, I'm, it's not one of my proud parenting moments. Um, okay, so let's have a look at this game, guys. Let me just give you a sense of what's going on with the inventory here. First, I wanted to show you about this website that I used to generate it. The, um, the website's called mazegenerator.net. You can see uh, the address right there, mazegenerator.net. And once you log into it, it just gives you a whole bunch of settings. I just went with the default setting though, a 20 by 20 maze, which worked out quite nicely. So I just clicked on generate and it created a new map for me. And then I downloaded it. I went save image as, and I downloaded 10 of these. I could have gone with a hundred even, right? So the idea is every time you start, there's gonna be a randomly generated maze that you can uh, navigate through. So I thought this website was really cool and I like the idea of being able to download something like this and then import it as a, as a um, background and then have you guys try to navigate it using code. So um, that's our starting point. Let's have a look at our code. We've got quite a few different sprites here. So we've got the maze sprites. As I said, there's 10 of them that I've loaded up here. Uh, let me just click on that sprite. So every one of them is a slightly different maze. They all start on the side and, um, oh, some of them are, oh yeah. So they, they, the way the software sets it up is so that there's the opening at the top and at the bottom. But every one of these things, once they get on the map on the screen, I just rotate them 90 degrees and that solves that problem. So one player's gonna start on the left, another one's gonna be on the right. You can enter the maze and you basically have the one person's entrance is the other person's exit. There's these black mask blocks that I've drawn, and this is what's gonna be covering up the maze. We're gonna have tiles covering up the maze, and when you walk over them, they're gonna disappear, basically. Here's our players, they're just simple dots. You can go with something more elaborate if you want. I just went with a classic red versus blue kind of setup here. Then there's our power-ups. We've got all kinds of power-ups. We've got an arrow here that makes you switch places. We've got a clock here, which is gonna be a time bomb. They don't look very good close up, do they? They're very pixelated, but these are these um, icons are designed to be viewed very small. If you look at them at their proper size, you can see that they look pretty sharp. You've got a dynamite thing. So this is the proximity bomb, which means that you can leave it there and it will stay on the screen until somebody moves close to it and then it will blow up. A good way to kind of mine the exit your map to make sure that your opponent doesn't sneak past you. There's an eraser block here that will actually delete parts of the screen. Though it won't delete the edges, it'll delete um, part, uh, a big circular chunk of the maze so that you can uh, create a shortcut for yourself. There's an eyeball icon here that will make it so that uh, that will uh, remove the mask from your uh, from your maze so that you'll be able to see the whole thing for a couple of seconds. There's a poof thing that will. Uh, that will get rid of everything in your inventory, basically, and clear the whole map off. And that's a great way to, um, to if somebody's uh, holding on to something that you know can be dangerous later, like a bomb or something, you can use that to clear their inventory. The spiral will send teleport everyone to, a, or it will teleport you to a random location on the screen. 
And the turtle will force your enemy to slow down for, I think, 10 seconds or so. So that's all the power-ups that we have. And the idea is basically that we're going to be using these power-ups to sabotage each other so that you get uh, through the screen first. I don't have an end condition in the game first, but we'll set some kind of a target goal, maybe um, three or five uh, points, basically, uh, to win the game. So first player to exit the maze a certain number of times. Um, anyway, so that's uh, our power-ups. I've got a whole bunch of... Um, stuff set up here um, that has to do with the interface. And I didn't, uh, I'm not gonna have you guys bother coding this stuff. So some of the code's already set up for this. Um, so when you click the green flag on your starter file, I've got a working file set up here, by the way, let me share it with you guys. There you go. So that's the working file that I'm using today. Um, so I will be saving that file. As always, I will be, um, just uh, saving this file every once in a while. If you get stuck, you can just reload my file and it'll get you right back where you wanted. So this working file, there's some code I'm not gonna bother doing with you. And if you click the green flag, you'll see what's going on here. It basically sets up um, a little interface at the top of the screen here. And these are all hints so that you know what, what power-ups you have and, um, and whether they're active or not. And um, there's, there'll be some other help here. So, um, this teleporter one, for example, when you grab one, this will go from ghostly and it'll turn black. And then you'll know that you have one of these in your inventory. And you'll also know that if you double click on the up key, that you will be able to, um, to activate that. And we've got the time bomb and the prox bomb and the eraser. The other ones, the other power-ups will activate when you land on them. You don't have to hold them in your inventory. They just happen automatically. But these four you can hold and, um, and use later. We're going to be using list variables to keep track of all this stuff as well. But we're not doing that till next week. All right. So uh, I've got a maze border here. It's the part that's not destructible. It's just the edges around the board. You can see that I've got the entrances set up in a different color so that you're not stopped by them. We've got score objects for, the, um, for red and blue. They don't really do anything. They just sit on the screen. And then we've got the, uh, the, a couple of the power-ups here. We've got the eraser, which just removes a square amount of the screen. It'll just cover it up with white. But because our collision detection is, um, is color-based, um, it'll be looking for black, uh, anything white it'll go through. So we can basically really literally erase a part of the map and then you'll be able to walk through it instead of worrying about the bombs, uh, in, instead of having to worry about walls. Uh, and then your time bomb um, sprite has the icon for the clock on it, but then it turns into an explosion. Can't see very well here. And then in the end, it leaves a white area as well, the area that you've destructed. So again, you can use this to walls in your maze and the same for the prox bomb it's exactly the same setup and it uh, it just has a different triggering mechanism there's a couple of text help things here that are going to appear on the screen to help you know what the powers do whenever you grab an icon this will appear in the margin of the screen let me show it here so you'll be able to actually see this on the side of the screen to tell you what the last power that you picked up actually does for you. So it'll help you to learn the game at the beginning stages anyway. You'll, um, it'll just be a reminder of what these icons mean. Okay, that's a lot of talking already. So let's get started coding, guys. Um, so we're gonna start with the uh, maze itself. So uh, let's grab a green flag. And we're just going to tell this to go to the middle of the screen. Sometimes when you're playing when you're playing this game, particularly when you're not inside the uh, project page, you can accidentally move stuff aside here. So we don't want that to happen. So we're just going to say when green flag clicked, so we're inside the maze. Let's just go back to the middle, which is zero zero. So we'll say go to zero zero. Let me max this screen out a little bit here so you can see my code a little better. Okay. Um, now, we've got a set up board um, message that's coming up here that's going to tell, um, let's click the green flag to get that recentered. There we go. So we're going to wait for an event here called set up board. So let's go when I receive, and we don't have a set up board, so let's go new message. We'll go set up board. And so when that happens, we're just going to pick a random maze to go through. So let's go switch costume. 
And instead of switching to one of our 10 costumes, we'll tell it to pick a random number from one to 10, which represents one of those costumes. There we go. Um, now, after we're done setting up the board, we're gonna start the round. So I'm gonna create another event. We've been doing this quite a bit lately, right? Rather than starting the game when the green flag clicks, we have a bunch of setup happening, and then we have a start round event that will keep getting called over and over again each time um, we die or something causes the game to reset itself. So let's go do a new message here. We'll call it start round. There we go. All right, and the only thing we have to do is, oh, so when we click the green flag, we're gonna hide our maps. We'll hide so that you won't be able to preview what the what the maze looks like as we're picking it. And we'll show it when I receive start round. This will happen after we've covered up the screen with black. And so um, that's what we'll deal with that. Um, now, uh, maze border, I let me just double check that and see whether, yeah, I left the code there that centers that. So we don't need to uh, worry about that code. Okay, so now we're gonna cover up our screen and that's using these blocks called may mask blocks. So let's go over and code them and you can see what's going on with that. So this is where stuff gets a little bit more interesting. Um, uh, so let's go when I click green flag, Zoom that again. Let me save my code just in case someone's fallen behind. It's pretty early in the game. Uh, set ghost effect to zero. Uh, oh, actually, um, so I, I think I've changed this. Um, in the early going, I used a ghost effect to hide the mass block, but I'm just using a hide now. So I don't think we're gonna bother with ghost effect. Um, we're just gonna say hide when legs click hide and then we're gonna broadcast that setup board message which is going to be received by the maze right so let's go events broadcast setup board and we're also going to set up the board on this side so this broadcast is going to reach over the maze and get it to pick a random thing but it's also going to start generating these mask blocks for me so let me show you how i built these it's just ba we're basically covering up the entire map with perfectly sized blocks. And I wanna show you the process that I used for that. So I had to figure out math-wise exactly how big these squares should be. I drew one of them. Let me just put it on the screen here and we'll bring it to the front maybe so I can show you. Go to the front. Okay, so here's one of my mask blocks. I wanted, to, I set it up so that there would be, a, uh, so that it would fit perfectly if I generated a certain number of these. So it was a bit of trial and error and a little bit of math, but basically um, I've made the pixels about 32, uh, so the square is 32 pixels wide, and then we can just take the width of the map and divide it by 32, and that's how you um, get. Uh, so it, it's basically a 320 pixel wide map, so we multiply it 10 times, and it will fill up the entire screen. So let's go when I receive setup board. When I receive, which is under events. When I receive setup board, let's go hide. We're going to start at the top left corner here of the screen. Um, so we'll, let's give it a go to command. We'll go go to X, Y, and we'll enter the numbers. I almost figured this out correctly, but it's actually minus 153 and Y of 153. There you go. So X of minus 153, Y of positive 153. And that will basically pop it back into that spot again. Let me show those um, just to give you an idea of what's going on here. Okay, now we're gonna do a repeat loop. So let's go, I'm not gonna attach this to the code right now, just because I wanna show you. So let's go repeat, uh, create clone of myself. Let's go to our looks menu. We'll go, or sorry, to our control menu. We'll go create a clone of myself and we'll move 32 pixels. So move 32 pixels to the right. And so let me just activate that to show you what happens here. So, whoa. So I typed three instead of 32. That's not very helpful. Let's go back to our starting position again. Let's stop. 
back to our starting position. It'll take 32 instead of 3. There you can see, and that covers up the whole screen. That last one there is, it, it hasn't made a clone of itself, so it's, that is the original block. And what we're gonna do at the end of this repeat 10 is like a typewriter coming to the end of a line. We're gonna go back to the left, and then we're gonna go down one and do it again. So we're gonna take this loop and put it inside another 10 loop. So what happens is when we're done this, we're gonna move down. So we're gonna change our Y by minus 32, which will bring it down by the size of our block. And then we're gonna go bring it back to the left again. So we'll set our X to minus 153, which is our starting X location. So we're changing our Y, we're moving it down, but we're setting our X, because we would just wanna go all the way back here. We could go change X by minus 320 or whatever, but that seems unnecessary to me. So now we wrap this whole thing up inside another repeat 10, because with things 10 deep as well as 10 horizontal, you can see when I click this, it will do it across, except I don't have my starting position set up properly. Let's try that one more time. And there we go. And so you can see the entire map's covered up. And then at the end, we're going to hide this guy, and that will solve all our problems. So let's just click on that. Um, and when I... Uh, Hold it, when I set up board, okay, let's click the green flag here and see what happens now. So, and then we're gonna show at the end of this, right? Let me go show. Oh, when I started the clone is what I need. Ah, so the show happens in the when I started the clone. It's coming back to me now, guys. Let me just finish this mask and then we'll take a little break here. So we'll, let's go when I started the clone. We're gonna show, we're gonna make these guys visible. Then we're um, going to, okay, so let's just click the green flag here and you can see there are maps generating, except our starting location's not here, but our starting location under setup board. There we go. And now we're starting, you can see the map is still hidden, but at the, but when we hide one of these now, you'll see that, you should see, Hold it. When I started the clone, we move one of these aside. Oh, our map is, our maze is still not showing. Set up board. When I receive start round, well, we haven't sent the start round message yet. Okay, we'll have to fix that in a second. Okay, so um, let's just carry on with this. When I started the clone, let's go forever. And here's what we're going to be checking to see if we're close enough to the maze to um to make that part of the maze get unhidden of course when we step on any block it's going to make that block visible plus anything nearby so we're going to set a distance here basically so um we need to do an if if else statement in here and we're basically going to say if we're close we're going to unhide these clones and if we're otherwise we're going to keep them hidden so the else statement here is just going to say hi do and here's where we're going to determine how far away we are. So let's grab an OR statement. We actually need two OR statements right now. So I'm going to grab two OR statements and put them inside each other so that we have three OR conditions. The third one we're going to enter later on. We don't need it right now. That has to do with the power up. But for now, we just want to check whether our distance to player one or player two is less than our um, less than 40. So let's grab a less than sign and we'll pop it in the first hole. We'll grab another less than sign and pop it in the second hole. We're checking to see if our distance is less than 40. Here we go. And so now let's look for that block that says distance to player. It's one of our sensing blocks and it's really useful. It is distance to right here. So really handy little video gaming block here. It lets you pick which sprite you are far away from and it'll basically tell you what distance you are from it. Really useful for all kinds of little game functions, but in this case, we'll say distance to player one, and we'll copy that and put it in the other place, and we'll say distance to player two. And so, oh, so actually, we want it to hide if it's true, and otherwise it's going to show. There we go. So we still haven't done the, 
a start round command here. So let me activate that right now. I'm trying to remember where the start round gets act. Oh, hey buddy, do we already have? Uh, were you going to say something, Chris? Under the the setup board. Yeah, under setup board. Are you looking at my documentation, buddy? I'll do a sneaky one. Well, actually, I haven't put it online, so I don't know. Okay, so under setup board here, we're going to go broadcast. Start round. Here we go. All right, let's check this out and see how it's working. So our board is generating. And you can see that our map has appeared underneath it. And now if I grab, so we won't be able to move our guys yet, but let's just pick them up and manually drag them across the screen. Let me plonk myself in the middle here. And you can see no matter where I go, I'm going to expose it. Sometimes the shapes are a little bit off. Uh oh, so again, I've accidentally dragged it off the screen here. I'll just click the green flag to reset it. And so both our players are going to, whoa, so the order's messed up here now, eh? Check that out. So now my map's gone to the front. I gotta make sure it goes to the back when I receive start round. Let's go back to the maze and we'll just tell it when I receive start round, let's go to the back. So go to back layer, let's solve that problem. Try that one more time. So when I clicked on it, I brought it to the front and that was the issue here. Okay, so again, we're working properly here and you can see that we can only see part of the maze at any given time, which is gonna add to the confusion and fun. Okay, so um, let's take a little break and then we will get our characters moving around the screen and um, we've got some fairly elaborate code to get them um, sensing the boundaries and stuff. So we'll do that in this. I don't have, I have starting positions for these guys set up? No, I don't. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's take a little break and see who's in here. So no one over in the, um, no one over in the YouTube chat still. We've still got all our friends uh, with us on Discord, though. Um, so I've been working with Deck quite a bit this week. Deck is one of our English um, followers from, uh, are you from London, Deck, or where are you from, buddy? London, yeah. Yeah, from London, yeah. okay. What's the weather like there today? Because it's rainy as heck here. Deck? It's good. It's good, good. So tell us a little bit of what you've been working on this week, Deck. Um, I made a few games. Yeah, you've been... Uh, I made a Pong game. A Pong game. AI. Yeah, that's the one I'm going to show these guys in a second. But uh, so Deck has been feverishly working, remixing games and doing all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to show you everything that he did today, but how many games did you remix this week, Deck? Let me see. Not sure. It was like five or six of them, at least anyway. And one of them, a Pong game, he, he turned it into a brand new game. I'm going to show you guys that next, actually. I was just super impressed. So uh, let me get Dex game up here. While I play it, you can kind of explain what's going on here, buddy. Let me go back to the screen here. All right, so here is Dex Pong game. Let me go ahead and click the green flag. Got some music going and... So I'm the player on the left. Deck has already has set up an AI for the player on the right, basically. And um, is it just matching the speed, the direction of the ball, Deck, or how is that working? Yeah, it's a simple script. Um, you match the ball Y. Yeah. Um, let me just turn the music off here, just so that we can talk a little bit while we watch this. Where's the music inside the backdrop? Inside, which one? The player one? Backdrop. Uh, the backdrop, oh, okay. I'm just going to disconnect the sound right now so that we can talk while we uh, play the game. There's a couple of different things here. You can see that the ball accelerates itself. How, do, how does the acceleration work, Dick? Whoa! Go ahead. 
Yeah, so the ball is constantly accelerating as you're going. It's a game that's intended to be very, very short, right? And so you're trying to see how fast you can keep the ball running, which is your score, basically, before you die. What was your high score, Dick? Um, 70. 70, okay. So anyway, this is in the remix room for which remix room is it in? Pong. Oh, in the Pong remix room, okay. I'm actually going to post this to the um, YouTube chat as well. If anyone's interested in trying this out, let us know what score you get. See whether you can beat deck score of 70-ish points. Okay, um, we got some Lunar Lander remixes that I think I'm gonna show you during your next break as well. Um, yeah, let's get back to the coding here, guys. So, um, now we got our maze mask running. Now we're going to move our characters around. So let's go ahead and move our characters around. Let's get into player one. And I'm just looking for the proper code. I've here. got a game as well. You do, Thane? What? What? Uh, an original game? No, it's a. A remix. It's a platformer. Oh, a platformer. Okay. Yeah. Actually, while we're um while we're looking at games, we could do that. Is it in the um, student? Yes. It's not finished, though. It's supposed to be an RPG platformer. Oh, okay. So it's a game in progress. Okay, we'll take a really quick look at it anyway. Just, um, all right, if you can talk me through this, because I haven't seen it before either, Bane. Yeah, um, just look at the instructions are right there. Oh, sorry. I should just get into the project screen. Yeah, because there's instructions. Oh, there. arrow keys to move and jump, R and D to return to door, E to interact with cubes. Space to exit the talk with cubes. Okay, so just walk me through this thing. Okay. So, um, so with the little bouncy thing, is oh, this? A... Yeah. Um, can you go back inside? Oh, inside. I forgot something. <laughs> okay. Set it back to zero zero. The zero. This this right here. Um, the mask should just be a different mask. But, um... Okay. Just change the costume back to the first costume. Is that the idea? Okay. You want me to do that right now? Okay, let me just reload the game. I didn't save my Maze Mayhem game. Okay, so let's click green flag here. Oh, now so you're at the door. I'm at a door. So to open. There's a bunch of areas right now, and you so can talk. Can I go left and right on the screen? Yes. Okay, so I can go. Yeah. So there's other screens I can go to here. And there, see that white cube? Yeah. Um. You. Yeah. I just press E. E. Oh, cool. So how did you do the text in here? This text is uh, is not the standard text, eh? So how did you do? Oh, you just have, you just designed a sprite for it. So you're going to design a different sprite for each little bit of text. I need yeah, your help. Yeah, the items are cool. Go down and you'll see something else cool as well. I'm, oh, go down in the map? Okay, yeah. So how do I get it? I, it's space to get out of that text. Okay, and yeah. so I'll go down this hole here. Oh, and there's a little chalice here. Can we wall jump or something? Yeah, to get... that's the heirloom. Um, you, your, t your jump's height is too um, short to get through there. Oh, and so you need something to make you jump higher. Very clever. I've been thinking about doing an RPG type game um, on our tutorials here. So I'm actually really curious to see what you're working on here. We might actually take what you're doing here and uh, remix it a little bit because I am interested in doing a, an RPG adventure game with you guys at some point. Um, okay, well, this is looking, this is inspiring me, Thane. I think that I might actually uh, want to do something similar to this. Have you, um, are you looking at this? So, so, this, so Thane's got like a little platformer game here that's, yeah, you that's an adventure. Yeah, and there's more sprites as well. Yeah. Yeah, if you get stuck like that, you just jump and you'll get out. Yeah. Like, that happens sometimes. I was talking to, uh, was it to you or to Deck this week about, um, the yeah. old Atari adventure game was it you I was talking to? No, yeah, it was to me. Oh, I was talking to Deck about it anyway. So um, about what? There's an old game for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred uh, called Adventure. It's a, it was one of the first kind of RPG type games. Uh, well, not really an RPG, more of an adventure game, I guess. Eh? Or what? What do you call? Game. Yeah, yeah, it was an adventure. Cookie. Yeah. Anyway. You gotta go in got to explore to um, escape. Yeah, we don't have time to get too deep into this uh, today, Thane, but... Um, yeah, that's all there is right now. Anyway. All right, well, we'll have a look at it again next week and see what kind of progress you've made, but this is looking really cool, buddy. Okay. Okay, let's get back to Maze Mayhem now. So we've got our map working beautifully Wait, um, now. 
I want to um, say something really quick. Yeah, sure, Thane. So, I'm hosting a contest on my game Zombies that I showed last week. Remember that game? Yeah, yeah, your Zombie Hunter game. What about it? Yeah, I didn't finish it, but I'm hosting a contest to see who can get the most money. Oh, the well... This will end on September 12th, and the one who can get the most money wins. Okay, and so how will they let you know that they've, uh, that you, that they've got the they most just, money? They can just chat to me. Okay, so on Discord, um, they, anyone who's on Discord can let you know. Otherwise, um, if you have... Whoever wins gets a project dedicated to them. Ooh, very cool, very cool. Okay, so if you're interested in entering Thane's contest, you can enter on Discord, or you can drop me an email at info at chromeworks.ca, and um, I will uh, pass any information along to Thane as well. Okay, let's get back to the coding, guys. So... Where are we? We are um, starting to work on the player sprites now. So let me just find the first block of player code here. Ugh, I just have the 15 pages here, so there's quite a bit of code to go through. Let me go over to player one here. Now I have a little bit of code here uh, that we're gonna be using later on. It was just quite complicated, and this has to do with the double tapping. I'll probably explain this to you next week. Um, but I, I thought rather than having you guys risk having to place all these and put them inside each other and get everything in, in the right order, it was just so complicated, I thought I'd save you the trouble. So we'll talk about this later. Just please don't delete it. It's not going to do anything right now. So, um, but but um, it will turn out to be useful next week as we're working on this. Okay, let's just, so we're inside player one. Let's go grab a green flag. I don't remember if I've saved my file lately, so let's just save that before we get started. And let's magnify. So let's send our guy to a start position. And uh, I have my start position in the documentation set kind of in the middle here, but then I realized when these things start appearing on the screen, you actually get stuck inside this text if you put yourself in the wrong place because it's looking for black and the text is black. You can actually get stuck trapped inside your own game text, which is no good. So uh, I moved the start position to have it a little bit closer to the wall. Let's, for, for player red, let's use a go to XY coordinate here and we'll enter the proper numbers, which are um, uh, minus 176 and minus six for your Y. We you click our green flag, you'll see that that will plunk us right down beside the entrance and not inside the evil black text that will get us into trouble. Okay, you can see that when we hit the stop button, the clones go away and we can see what our maze is gonna look like. So the next time you click green flag, it's going to change to a different maze, so it's deceptive. Um, all right. Now, Jeffrey put a weight in here that's 3.35 seconds, and I'd love for him to explain what that's all about. Hey. Why don't you just get on the Discord, buddy? Or well, that's okay. Like all right. So Jeffrey's here. Say hi to everyone, Jeffrey. Oh, there you are. <laughs> there you are. Hi. Okay. So explain why it's exactly 3.35 seconds or delay here. I don't understand um, it. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. What is this delay on when the game starts? Yeah. I believe this is some calculation based on how long, how long it will take to put down all the mask boards. Okay. Um, that's the exact length, maybe given a little bit. I'm not uh, sure. Okay. So you could have gone four seconds and it wouldn't have been tragedy, but you just wanted to be really precise. Enough. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's either that or that I was like, oh, four, 3.5 feels like a bit too much, but three is a bit too little. I'll hit it halfway. Huh. One of those two. Would but. that be the same speed regardless of how fast your computer was? Like that um, Scratch runs at a constant rate no matter how fast your computer's running, right? Is that... um, Scratch can, I don't think Scratch skips for I don't know. If your computer's running really badly, it yeah. can probably run slower, but it'll never go faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So you can do little precise timing things like that. Anyway, so if you guys are, um, are as OCD as Jeffrey is, you can go 3.35. Otherwise, you can just go wait four seconds and it won't be a tragedy. All right, let's uh, underneath there, we'll do a forever. Um, now, we need a variable there that we're not going to use right away, and that's going to tell basically, oh... Actually, we do need it right away. It's a variable that's it's called that uh, it's called movement key pressed, and that's just going to track whether you're holding a button down or not. And that has to do with the um, double click code that we're going to be implementing next week. 
but um, but it'll also flip on and off every time you hold down a, um, a button. So let's go to our variables. We'll grab a set variable button and we'll change it to set the uh, movement key press, which is under letter M. And we're setting it to zero because we're not moving at the beginning of the game. Okay, we're just gonna do some if statements here. We're gonna be uh, having all our movement go inside a custom block that's called probe move. And Jeffrey's a big fan of probing when you're inside these kind of color sensitive maps. So he's gonna be jumping ahead, checking to see our little player's gonna jump ahead, check and see if he's touching black. And if he is, he'll back up. And that's the way you'll get stuck behind the walls, basically. So um, we're gonna go ahead and code that in a minute. Let's go set up that block though. So we're gonna go to our My Blocks and we're gonna click Make a Block. We're just gonna call it Probe Move. There we go. Now let's set up our directional keys. We'll grab an if statement, control if. So I'm gonna start with my left movement, which for player one is gonna be WASD. So let's go grab a, from our sensing block, we'll grab if D key pressed. One of the nice things about using a round character is we don't have to worry about which direction he's facing, right? He's always gonna look the same. So if you guys are coding this um, with a different character, you might wanna be careful about, um, about how your character's positioned. Okay, so we're gonna tell him point to the right. So point in direction 90, and then we'll just do a probe move. So I'm gonna grab a um, block from the My Blocks here that says probe move. And this is exactly the same thing we're gonna do. So we're just gonna point in a direction that we're gonna check and see if we can move in that direction. And then we'll move in that direction. And that's what we're gonna probe and then move is the idea. Okay, so we're gonna duplicate this D block. I'm gonna hold my cursor over the if statement and right click and go diff. Uh, sorry, duplicate. Now I have a second one here. So I'm just gonna change the second one to A. So if I press the A key, which is to the left, I'm gonna point to the left, which is minus 90. Let's do that, duplicate again. Remember guys, if you're on a Chromebook, you can just hold down two fingers on the keypad and that's the same as right clicking. Since there are no right clickers on Chromebooks. I am fond of telling you guys that. All right, next if. It's going to be if key W is pressed. It will take us up and we'll point up, which is zero. And the last one is if key S is pressed. Ah, that's R, there's S. And we'll point down, which is 180. There we go. Now, when you start your game, nothing will happen because we're not actually moving yet. We're just sending all our movement commands over to this probe move block. And there's where we're gonna start checking to see if we touch a wall. So let's go ahead and do that before we get lost in the weeds here. Um, so the movement's complicated. We're gonna move um, one step and then we're gonna add some movement to ourselves later, basically. So our, our steps are gonna come in a couple of different pieces here. A little bit complicated, but it'll make sense as we're doing it. So we start by moving forward one step and we're gonna activate that variable that says we're moving. So let's go movement key set, movement key pressed to one. So that will tell the other scripts that we're moving. All right, now here's what we need to know if we're touching a wall or touching the outer wall, the inner walls or the outer wall. So we gotta get it to check for two colors. Let's go grab an if statement here. No, actually it's an if else statement. I caught myself for once. I haven't seen Peter here lately to yell at me about this stuff. Okay, if we'll grab an or statement here. And I'm gonna to say touching either of those two colors. So let's go do it manually. I, I deleted the blocks that detect our colors. So we're gonna to have to go back and do it manually by checking in the game here. So let's go grab a touching block, touching color block from our sensing blocks. We're actually, actually gonna put two of those down while we're there. And let's, let's go pick the color black. So I'm gonna click on the color block here. And this one, Actually, I'm gonna do it the proper way here. So I'm gonna click on the little eyedropper here and that will give me a little eyedropper tool that I can move anywhere on the screen. I'll just click it on a black area. And now I've selected exactly that shade of black, which is 000 here. 
you got to be careful with black in particular because there are different ways to mix black in this wacky thing. Like here's, in this case, because our brightness is at zero, it doesn't matter what the saturation is. So Scratch will detect this as a different black than this one. And that's why I use the eyedropper tool. Otherwise, uh, you could get messed up. So this one is a true black, which is zero, zero, zero on all three settings. And let's grab that purple color as well. I'll just use my eyedropper again, click down on the big fat purple and we're good to go there. Okay, so if I detect any of those colors, the first thing we're gonna do is move backwards. So we're gonna move minus two steps. And that will stop us from going through the wall. Every time we try to cram into it, we'll just get pushed backwards by this invisible force field. All right, um, now we've got some other stuff here that we're gonna use later. I don't think I need that right now. So let's just go grab inside here, we'll grab another if else statement. Uh, and we're going to need to repeat this whole or thing again. So I'm going to double click, I'm going to right click on this or statement. Let me save my file. I'm going to right click on it uh, right over the word or so that I grab all three blocks when I duplicate. And I'm just going to pop it into the if statement here. And so if I'm touching a wall, okay, this is where it gets confusing. So if, uh, oh, I, uh, okay. Wow. Okay. So this is, um, there's a part of the game here that we we're not going to use next, but I think we should implement it first. Actually, I'm going to pull this out for now because I'm worried that if I mess this up, that, uh, that it's a whole bunch of stuff all nested inside each other. So, Let's go ahead and code the part that we don't need yet. And then we will um, code the rest. So there's an if statement here. And we're checking. So this is where we're checking to see um, before we move, we're checking to see if we've been slowed down by a turtle event, which means player one has turtled us. They've cl clicked on a turtle icon here. So inside here, we're going to look for something, okay, timer minus blah. Okay, so we need a greater than sign here. So again, this isn't gonna do anything to the game right now, but later on, oh, we need a, yeah, greater than. So we're gonna sell greater than 10 seconds. And in here, we need a minus sign. Let me explain this to you in a second here. Uh, so let's grab a minus sign. So we're gonna, so we're gonna in here, put the timer. So if, if we've been, if our timer has changed by less than 10 seconds, so timer minus the, uh, the time that, that, that we enabled the turtle. So it's basically, let's say our timer is at 20 and, at, um, and, then, t and then we um, enable the 10 second timer. So, so we land on the turtle and it lasts for 10 seconds. So basically our timer is at 20, but we don't want it to uh, go off until this is until it's gone 10 seconds. So it'll start at 20 and then 10 seconds later, when this variable reaches 10, it'll be 20 minus 10 is greater than 10 or 21 minus, sorry, minus um, 10 is greater than 10. And that will tell us that our timer has finished running. So if our timer, uh is running okay so we need to put a variable in there which is a variable is called turtle player one enabled time it's already in there so that's telling us if um the opponent has grabbed the turtle icon and that timer that got set to when i grab the turtle icon is greater than 10 then we're going to move only a speed of one so i'm going to go to our, my motion blocks i'm going to move one step. All right, so here, I think we're back on track here. So now inside there, we're gonna put the if else statement. This is where it gets a little bit confusing. So I'm gonna grab this and put it inside the, the other if statement, just like that. All right, so we've got three if statements. None of them are on the same level. This one's here, this one's inset from that one, and this one's inset from that one. Be super careful about these guys. If they're in the wrong order, this will not work. I'm going to save my file right now if you're confused. 
All right. So inside here, we're going to say, if I'm touching the color, we're going to move minus two steps again. Otherwise, oh, minus two. Otherwise, else, we're going to move one step. And inside here, we're testing for the color again. So this is something that Jeffrey set up here, and I'm not 100% sure I completely understand it. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to jump in and just explain what's going on here? Because this is the part, the movement part that most sure. confuses me. So can you just walk us through the code? I'm just going to finish that last little bit here. Move minus two, and it should be good. Let me save my file in case anyone wants to copy it. So I'm going to invite Jeffrey in here just to um, just to, uh, to explain what's happening in the code here. You can grab my mouse okay. if you want to. Yeah, so um, this is, it, it looks a lot more complicated than it is. What's really happening here is we're trying to do a loop. We're just trying to do the same thing like three times, but if one of them doesn't work, then none of the other ones will. So what that is, is if we just take out this bit here, what we're really doing is we're saying, I want to move one step forward. Mm -hmm. And if I and then okay, after I've moved one step, am I touching anything? And then if I am, I'm going to go back two steps. Um now I know we're going back more than we're going forward. Uh that's just because it it'll create a bit of like a bounce when you move forward too much. It just helps the player not get caught on things as easily. Um so yeah, anyway, you'll move forward and if you touch something, you'll get sent back. That's simple enough. And then in the else, if you don't touch something, you're allowed to move forward again. And it's really just the same code uh, copied another time. So if we forget, this is for later, though we're going to put it in now. Um, but if we just take like this part here, this is just the exact same code. And we're just slotting it right in the else. And then we're doing the exact same code again, and it's just repeating the same move one step, move back two steps if we hit something. But if we do hit something, we don't do any of the later move. Oh, so we're moving ahead one if we can, and if we can, we end up moving two, and we just keep moving ahead three times until we hit a wall, basically, or until we're done. So we either move three or we hit a wall at one or we hit a wall at two or we hit a wall at three, basically, right? So it's yeah. a way to move at a speed of three, but constantly be checking um, whether you're hitting a wall. So we don't want to check if we hit a wall every three pixels because because then we might miss the wall, right? Is that your concern? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so this is a really uh, different movement cycle. I haven't done anything quite like this before, but I understand where you're coming from. So it should be working now. Eh? Let's give it a try. And let's just do a w, quick WASD here. And you can see that we're bouncing off the walls when I hit it. Let me maximize the screen here for you guys. Yeah, so it actually seems to be working quite nicely. So we're inside the maze now, and we can navigate around quite nicely. Yeah, beautiful. And so the nice thing about this is we can load up any maze uh, design that we want as long as it's based on black sprites or an, on black wall. So anything that's a black wall, will it will repel itself from. Otherwise, it'll just go wherever it wants to. And that's how we're going to be able to erase it. Um, at the end as well. We're going to be able to just cover this map up with a little bit of white to create exploded areas that you're allowed to walk through because as long as those walls are covered up, we're not going to detect the black anymore. Okay, that's be moving beautifully. Really nice. Okay, so um, let's do the same thing for player two then. So uh, we don't have anything right now in player two except for this throwaway code that we're not going to use yet. Let's just take all of these objects and drag them over to player two right now. Then we'll make some minor changes to them. So I'm going to grab my green flag, drag it to the player two, and you'll see that it wiggles around or the sprite underneath wiggles around when you placed it properly. So remember, you're pointing your arrow. No, don't worry about the actual thing that you're grabbing and whether that's pointing at it. Just make sure your mouse arrow is pointed right at player two in the middle of it and then let go and that will copy it over to player two. Let's do the same thing with our probe move here. I'm just going to copy it over. 
we go over there, you can see both blocks copied and they're on top of each other. So we'll have to move them out of the way. All right, let's have a close look here. We're gonna change these um, directional keys around. So let's go, um, D is right arrow, A is left arrow, W is up arrow, and S becomes down arrow. And I don't think there's anything else we have to do here. We're going to go turtle player one enable time. We'll just change that to player two. So player two gets a turtle, he'll slow player one down and vice versa. Crash that one. And I think player two should be ready to go. Let's give the game a try and have a looky here. Ooh, my player two start position is in the wrong place. So we're just going to go to my start position here and change it from a minus 176 to a positive 176. And that will solve all our problems. There we go. We're over on the right side of the screen now, as expected. And here we go. Beautiful. All right. So both players are navigating. I'm not a very good one-handed player to here, but you can see how... In order to do, uh, I did a little um, animation of this over on the website. I want to show you this, guys. Um, over on my Chromeworks website. Where am I? Do, here it is. I've got uh, a little preview of the game running. I covered it up with dark blue so that the text would be visible above it. So you can't really see much, but... And I didn't have anyone to play the game with, so I actually programmed this just using move blocks. And so, so I basically created two AIs for the game that would navigate through the maze just so that I could animate all this stuff exploding and moving around. The, um, the actual... Uh, I can show you the actual animation. Here it is, mazemayhem.gif. So there's the actual animation that I created here. So there's a finished game in action with explosions and stuff as well. And so I had to do that in order to, add to, um, to, sh to create a little preview of what the game would look like. And it wasn't quite ready, so I just baked it, basically. Okay, so my movement is working beautifully now. Um, when we get back from our next break, we're going to do the last part of it that we're going to do today, which is going to be randomly placing our uh, objects on the screen, our, our power-ups. And then next week, we'll bring those power-ups to life and get them running. But for now, um, I think that'll be enough. Let me show you guys some remixes of Lunar Lander first. So I have remixes here from... Um, I know Gamer Davey gave us one. I've got one here by Deck as well. If anyone else has a Lunar Lander uh, remix, put it into the remix room right now. Or uh, just send me a link in the chat and I will show it, but right now I have two of them to show. So last week's game was Lunar Lander, um, and here's Chris's chess-themed remix. I really liked it a lot. Let's, uh, Apollo, you are enter cool. your name. Oh, so it actually wants your name first. Whoa, oh, okay, this is, this is Dex's game, not Chris's game. Sorry about that. Got a lot of chess Apollo, fans here. So he's made a chess piece here and a chess background. I think it's actually kind of cool. So the game is identical. It's just got this really cool chessboard background going on here. Let me try to land properly here. Oh, there we go. There we go, and there's no landing sound, but oh, I turned into a, a horse, a, a knight character when I landed, that's pretty cool. All right, so this is a really nice little remix deck. I really like this one a lot. You've been a busy boy. All right, and Gamer Davey, of course, has come up with a wacky um, Nintendo-themed remix here. Davey says that the object is, I haven't managed to get this going. I was playing it a little bit before. He says the object is to actually crash into stuff. So your thrust, you have to go upside down to thrust basically, and then you can land. What to crash it? You want to crash, right? So, whoa, so my, 
All right, I'm crashing the wrong way now. Whoa, I'm crashing it from underneath. Wow, boom. So I would have liked to have seen an explosion there, Davey. So every time we whack into one of these, let me just stop the game for a second. So Davey, um, what's the object of the game then? There's something that we're trying to get to or are you just trying to get rid of all the blocks? The goal is to crash, is to crash as many of them as you can and destroy all the bricks. Oh, so when you destroy all the bricks, then you've won. Um, is there a way to lose the game? Then what? Is there a way to lose the game, Davey? Um, I don't think so. You don't think so. So we just basically keep trying until you destroy all the blocks, eh? I'm going to disable yeah. your music here just so I can um, show the game. And so the game will detect when you've gotten rid of all the blocks? Yeah. Yep. All right. Whoa. So the directional stuff is a little bit confusing here, I'm finding. Like, I want my thrust to come out from underneath me, but in fact, I have to aim my umbrella at something, and I have to aim my feet at something, and then thrust at it to shoot. That, to me, is not really super intuitive, Davey. I like your game concept. It looks like your explosion um, could have been animated or something, too, or, or a sound effect or something to show us... Um, to make it a little more interesting. So just a few little touches that would have made it uh, better. So it is uh, keeping track of the number of blocks on the screen and when we get rid of all of them, they'll uh, it'll give us some kind of a winning condition. Or is that the idea or? Yeah, let me just play this a couple more times here. Oh. And so it, it will detect that we're done, eh? Yep. Okay, let me just, if I can nail this. Whoa, I missed it. So the thrust is so low that... Oh, I'm stuck here. So it seems like once you get down, it's hard to get back up again. Eh? I don't know if it has to do with the way you... Go to the side and you'll self-destruct. You will, eh? If okay. If you fall to... If you go down, fall... Okay. If you fall down and you can't get back up, Go to the right side and you'll self-destruct. Oh, and then you'll self-destruct. Okay, on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, so a few little things I would probably tweak, but a nice try there, Davey. Anyway, it's an interesting remix. I really like the, the way that you reverse the objective of the game so that you have to crash instead of avoiding crashing. I think that's a really interesting little innovation, buddy. So impressive. Did anyone else get a... Um, a Lunar Lander remix or anything else they want to show? Um, no, I guess not. Eh? Thane, did you have anything that you finished up? You you showed me your, your other game already. I think we're good to go here. Okay, so let... Well, I have something, but it's not that good. Yeah, okay, let's not worry about it for this week. It's already 11 o'clock, so we'll probably want to get yeah. moving anyway. Okay, so remember, guys, if you have any remixes you want to show, you can save them in the student showcase. Um or into the remix room for that particular game. So if you remix a game like Lunar Lander, then put it in the Lunar Lander remix room. Anything new here that's worth showing that's not just a copy of my game, I will show on the live stream here. So want to get on YouTube, this is the way to do it. Okay, let's go back to Maze Mayhem. As I said, we're um, we're not gonna we're just gonna place the power-ups today and then we'll be done. So let's go back to our uh, power up. Okay, here's where I think Jeffrey's gonna have to help me to get straightened out again, eh? So we're inside the code for the power ups, right? Jeffrey? Yeah, I, yep. Okay, so I want to start on the green flag part here. Um, yeah, yeah, you can pretty much just, with this stuff, mm -hmm. it's really just go in order. I mean, um, you don't need to worry about the inventory really right now, but you could. Yeah. Um, and then just go in order of precedence where the code appears. Like, do all of this, do all of this, then go into each function and then the function in the function. Yeah. This, so was, de like, this was developed in exactly the order that you would go following. The yeah. Okay, so just click, click the green flag and we'll go from there. Okay, so I haven't had a, a complete look at all of this code yet, which is one of the reasons I want to save it for next week as well. But we're going to get started, as I said, and place the code today. 
And by next week, I'll have a better understanding of what's going on here. So I, as I said, I conceptualized this game and, uh, and came up with all the details of how it would work and then kind of turned it over to Jeffrey to do the, the guts and bits and pieces of it. And um, that's why I'm not 100% briefed on how this works. But um, next week, I should have it properly figured out. Okay, so when green flag clicked, um, so we're keeping track of our inventory, basically what we what what we're holding and what we're not. Davy, your uh, microphone still turned on, buddy. I can hear you breathing. All right, so uh, we're keeping track of uh, what we are holding in our inventory, what we're not, with a list variable. So some of these things are not going to be working yet, but I just want everything set up so that I don't forget it for next week when we come back to this. So let's go to our list variables. We'll go to our variables. We're going to go down to the bottom, um, and we're just going to clear out. So when we start our game, any the list that's left over, just like variables, lists will remain from one game to the next if you click the green flag. So we're going to delete those, just reinitialize our variable. We're going to go delete all of P1 inventory and delete all of P2 inventory right now. And um, there's a bunch of variables here that we... Let's just get them set up right now, okay? So um, let's go set some variables. We'll go set I enabled time to minus 100. And that will help us figure out whether uh, whether we can see the screen or not. That'll just basically count it up in tenths of a second, I believe. Then uh, we need the timer for the turtle enabled. So we need two more set variables here. One of them is going to be uh, turtle one player enable time player, and the other one's going to be turtle player two enable time. Those are both going to minus 100. So they all function the same way. It's basically setting a 10 second timer or, or a timer for when you can um, for when you can view the map and for when your opponent's going to be slowed. And we're going to set the, we've got a variable keeping track of power ups, and that's called power up count. So we're going to set that variable, set power up count to zero. That means we have no power ups on the screen right now. All right, let's bring the power ups to the front. We'll go to our motion blocks. We'll go, uh, no, our looks blocks, sorry. We'll go, go to the front. So go to front layer. And then we'll go hide. All right, so the clones will be visible, but of course the reference object will be hidden. And inside here is where we're going to actually place our guys. So let's put a forever loop here. Now we're going to send our guy to, um, we're going to set up our power-ups a little bit like we set up our masking block as well. We're going to have them start on the left-hand side and then start to see whether they're going to generate themselves as we go across the screen. So let's tell our, our first guy to go to a location. We'll go to motion blocks. We'll grab a go to XY command. And we'll tell it to go to minus 152, 152, which is the top left of your screen. And you can see when I do the visibility thing, it'll so that's where we're starting. This is where our reference guy is starting, and we're going to see if we want to place it in that spot or not. So we're going to do that with random numbers. Let's grab an if statement. And we'll go if power up count is less than seven. Let me save my file. We'll go uh, less than. So if our power up count, if we have less than Sorry, if we have, we're going for eight power-ups on the screen at any given time. So if our power-up count is less than seven, then we're going to keep running the loop. And now we're going to take this reference guy. We're going to move him across the screen. We're going to, um, uh, we're going to have him pick an X coordinate randomly. Then we're going to have him pick a Y coordinate randomly. So let's go change X in here. Motion change X by and here's where we're gonna do a little bit of math so we want this thing to go across 16 times right because we've got 16 um different pathways here for count let me just show you so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixty uh more than sixteen eh? 
12. Let's see how this goes. Um, so change x by, and we're going to pick a random number in there. Pick a random number. And, but we're going to multiply that random number by 16. So before we enter numbers there, let's grab a multiplication symbol, put our random number inside. So the way we're going to keep these guys properly spaced is by multiplying them by 16, which is the number of spots we're going to have to go across. The math works out nicely, I think. So we're going to go, oh, so it's 19 pixels across. We're going to go, or 20 pixels across. We're going to go from 0 to 19. So, it, so if it goes zero, if it picks a random number of zero, it is going to stay in this x coordinate, right? If it picks a random number of one, it's going to go one times sixteen, which will move it over sixteen pixels, which is the width of our walls here. This makes sense to me now. So it'll go here. If we roll a two, it'll go here. If we roll a three, it'll go here, and that's the way it'll work. So it'll place it. So the nice thing is we're not going to have these guys appear in the middle of our walls. If we totally randomize the positions, stuff would appear in weird positions like this, where it was on both sides of the wall. We want stuff to be positioned properly inside the walls. And fortunately, our maze is made in such a way that we can do the math and it works out quite nicely. Um, okay, so pick random time 16. Okay, um, oh, I put this all into the wrong spot by the way guys so this multiplication symbol goes inside the change x now we're going to grab a change y block so we'll go to our motion blocks we'll change y by now we're going to do the same math again so i'm just going to duplicate all of this math all of this green stuff by moving my cursor over the multiplication symbol i'll go duplicate i'll pop it down here and we're going to do the same thing we're going to change our y except we're going to go down which is a negative y, so we're going to go minus 16 for our y. And uh, you're going to see nothing right now because everything is going to be hidden. All right, let's keep going here. We can't actually see anything yet. We're, so once we're done positioning ourselves, um, um, so I, I wish I could show you basically, but so it's going to pick a random x coordinate, then pick a random y coordinate, then plunk itself down there, and then it's going to create a clone when it gets to that spot. So we're going to go create a clone of myself, and that's going to be inside the if statement. And we're going to change that power up variable, change power up count by one. And so that'll keep track of how many power ups are already on the screen. We're just going to keep randomly placing these guys until we're done. So um, our clones aren't visible yet. Let's go up to the top of the screen again and we'll go when the, I started the clone, we'll go show. And that should make our clones visible. Let's maximize our screen here and have a look. And there we go. So we have exactly eight of these blocks they're all turtle blocks right now right because that is costume number one well, let's get them to randomly respawn just by going in and going switch costume two and we'll get it so we've got eight different costumes let's just go pick a random number from one to eight here pick random from one to eight let me save my file and let's max our screen out and try again here. Ready? So yeah, now we have a good random representation of all our sprites. So we're not going to have all the power-ups available at once, and some of them are going to be available more than once as well. So it's a little bit wacky. Um, so as I said, we're going to be moving through the uh, map, trying to pick these up. And, tr and um, some of them are going to sit in our inventory, and some of them are going to work right away. So we can't do anything with them right now because they're not actually working. So let's, um, we're going to do one more thing here that's going to make them disappear when we touch them, and that'll probably be all we get to today. Let's go into our forever here. Now, Jeffrey, resize these a little bit. I don't think we have to resize them, though. It looks like the size is pretty good. Uh, so let's just go if touching, if touching player one or player two. So I'll grab an or statement. In. And we'll grab some touching blocks. So if touching player one. Player one. 
Oh, it's way up at the top. Player one or player two. Then, okay, so we've got a, uh, a block of code here called catch power up and it's a custom block. So let's go ahead and set that up right now. I think it has some permutations in here. Let me just double check the code. I've lost myself here. Okay, I don't see the touch patch power up. Add to inventory. Just looking for my documentation here, guys. Just a second here. I don't see those blocks anywhere. Let me go have a look at my finished code. They somehow did make it into code here. So. Catch power up, yeah. All right, so we've never done this before, um, but we're gonna be creating a custom block that has some parameters in it, basically. So we don't, uh, we wanna detect that we catch the, uh, that we caught the power up, that we touched it, but we also wanna know which player touched it, because this is inside the power up thing. So it needs to know which player actually touched it. And it also needs to know which one we touched. So both those variables are going to be contained inside the block here. I'm going to do a, a little lesson sometime on how these custom blocks work for complicated things like that. But just follow along with me right now. So we're going to go to my blocks. We're going to make a block. And the block is going to be called catch power up. And now we're going to add some inputs to it. So I'm going to go add an input. They're both. Jeffrey, these are Boolean inputs or or just plain old number or text inputs. Oh, hold it. Catch power up as a Boolean and okay. All right, so we're gonna add a Boolean input. Boolean just means it's a yes no condition, right? Uh, so all that means is um, where you can either you either either player one touch it or player two has touched it, right? So that boolean we're gonna call it. It's just a variable, basically. We're gonna call it player touched. I'm fine, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. It's just to specify which player was touched. Yeah. So yeah. we're just figuring out which player is touched, and we're also gonna add a um, an input that the that the number or text variable. So we'll click on that number or text, and the second input will be power up. So this is just a fancy way to create variables that are all connected to the same thing so that when we um, go ahead and change these, we can just type into here and it's a little bit confusing, but basically you're creating a block that has variables attached to it already. We're not going to use this one today. I just wanted to set it up properly because we're going to use some of the uh, blocks that it contains here. So we're going to be feeding information into this. So when this starts running, it won't be able to start running until it knows which player was touched. So that's why it, um, we're going to create that block called player touch. And you can actually drag it right out of here, you see. And we can use these blocks in our code up here. And, and once it gets entered here, it'll go down into here. And those numbers that we set up in the if statement will work out in the actual code. And so we can use the same code for multiple purposes. So we can use, we don't have to have two different blocks of code. If we didn't do this, we'd have to have one block of code for if player one touched you and a different block of code for if player two cut touched you, or you'd have to do an if statement inside your code to make it do the same thing in two different ways, depending on who touched it. So this is a nice way to build it all into the same block of code here. So if touching player one or player two, uh, when I started the clone, I'm lost here again. Then we're going to go catch power up. So let's grab that catch power up. And our uh, player touched, we're going to put a sensing block in here that says touching player one or touching player two. So our sensing blocks, we'll go touching. player one, if touching player one, costume number, okay, so touching player one, uh, 
Um, this is the part that, again, I don't understand. Sorry, Jeffrey's going to have to help me with this as well. Jeffrey? Sorry, one last thing here. Yeah. So this custom block has a parameter where you put in touching player one here. And this, again, I don't understand because we're checking to see if we're touching player one or player two. And this little block here, um, that's to pass on. So we know we're touching if we're setting this variable. Yeah. We know that we are touching player one or player two already. So asking touching player one there is effectively the which one are we touching? Because we know we're touching one of them, so yeah. if we're touch, so if this is true, then we must be touching player one, and if it's false, we're touching player two. Oh, but it, okay, so we don't need an if else there because though no, no, it's it's just that'll work because the else is that it'll be if this is false, then he has to be touching player two. Okay, there's That's only fa okay, yeah. all right. So we're saying all right. So this is gonna flip itself if we're touching player one, and if not, then it'll. Go oh, okay, and we also want to know the costume number that we're wearing, and that's what will tell us um, which uh, power up we've grabbed, right? So I'm going to go grab costume number. So our catch power up. Once we start working on this code, it will know which player was touched, whether it's player one or player two, and it will know which costume we're wearing as well, and it will be able to use that in the code to do stuff. So um, let's leave that there. Now, when we've used our power up, we have to change that variable back down by one. So let's go change uh, power up count by minus one. That will keep track of the fact that one of these guys has disappeared off the screen. And a new one will appear at a random place later on to fix it. This script is still running over here. It, and it'll see that if that number gets down below that threshold, less than seven, it'll know to place another power up on the screen randomly. So there will always be eight power ups visible on the screen. Okay, and then after that, we're just going to delete this clone. Let's go to our control block. So we'll go delete this clone. Okay, so we will do the, um, the define catch power up uh, next week on next Saturday, and then we'll do all the different powers. Let's just test that out right now and see if we can- Can you save your file? There's a yeah, let me, sure, let me save my file. There you go, Thane. All right, I'm gonna click my green flag, and let's just give this one little try. So all we're testing for right now is whether when we grab one of these power-ups, it disappears off the screen. They won't do anything yet. If I can find my way over to here, the key maze, there we go. And you can see that when I grab that eraser, a time bomb appeared at the bottom of the screen here. Let's navigate around a little bit more. This is the game that I really strongly recommend you play in max screen mode. A lot of these other ones, you can play them off of other screens. Let's touch this, uh, time, this um, prox bomb. There you go, and a new block appeared here. You can see when I created that. All right, so if you play this game in the reduced mode here, like normally when you play a game, you could play it in, um, uh, let me, I've already saved the file here. Atomic. You could play it in project mode here. Yes, Thane? Um, I suggest that maybe we should do a cloud project sometime. A cloud project, what do you mean? Oh, that uses cloud variables? Yeah, the only problem I have with cloud variables is that people who aren't scratchers, so people who are new to Scratch, who ha who don't have permissions, aren't able to use cloud variables. I've had trouble, but uh, cloud variables I found are great for high score tables. Um, I've tried to do like multiplayer games with cloud variables, and they're always flaky. They never work the way that I want them to. What else would you do, Thane, with a with a cloud variable? What kind of stuff would you do with one? So cloud variables, you mean like you can have a two player game, like people connecting from two computers. Yeah, so Jeffrey's saying the same thing, that they're really, really not suitable for multiplayer. They're, so they're good for keeping track of stuff between games, like high score tables and stuff like that, but otherwise I don't think they're that useful. Jeffrey, you yeah. wanted to add something? Oh, I, I tried real hard to become a scratcher back in the day, um, like for a while. I did because I wanted to use cloud variables to make a multiplayer game. Uh, it, it didn't work. It was really sad. You can't make multiplayer games with cloud variables. I tried really hard, trust me. Yeah. 
So there's a bit limited useful things you can do with cloud variables. If anyone has a, a good idea for what to do with a cloud variable, I'm happy to design a game for you guys that uses them, but we've got to find a creative way to use this information. And I'm not quite sure other than high score tables, I've never really seen it. Yes. Um, I'm thinking we do a doodle jump game sometime. A doodle jump. Okay, that's yeah, quite- like a game where you just keep jumping and each jump you get a, um, you get a higher score until you fall. Okay. Um, I don't think I've played doodle jump before. It's pretty replicated idea. Oh, really? Okay. So Jeffrey says that um, doodle jump is a totally doable thing. I think so. He thinks so. Um, I believe there's some kind of mechanic. It's like an endless platformer where you're going up. Yeah. You can create platforms under you. Um, you I, I you draw know, platforms? I don't know how complicated the mechanism for the platform yeah. is, but you could probably do it with color detection and pen tools. All right. You do a floor is lava version, too. A floor is lava version. That's interesting. It, yeah, it's something it's really along those lines. Yeah. It's doable yeah. exactly the, the way people will come and get you. So you yeah. So, uh, so the lava keeps going up and up and up, and, uh, and you have to keep climbing to stay out of the lava. That's not a bad idea. We're going to, um, Jeffrey's going to investigate that um, and we'll see if we can come back. We've got our project for next week. We're going to finish this maze mayhem up anyway, but um, we'll put that in the hopper and see if we can get that done. That's a good idea, Thane. All right, guys. So uh, for once, uh, I was a little clueless on some of this code, but it's all working properly anyway. It looks like our game's working quite nicely. So our game is remixable right now. Let me just go back to my other screen so I can talk to you a little more intimately. And you got two if else's today. Yeah, and I actually, for this is the first time ever, I think I've, I haven't made one if else mistake once today. And I haven't had my code um, mess up and have to go back and fix something. So it's a red letter day here for us guys. Despite the fact that I didn't understand some of my code, it was really helpful to have Jeffrey here to explain some of it. By next week, I will be totally up to date on how these power-ups work. As I said, I designed them, but I didn't code them. And so some of the code is a little bit of a mystery to me. Jeffrey has, um, it, as I said, is a really, really um, experienced coder. And he does stuff in ways that's not always obvious, but it's very, very efficient. And so that's why when you look at it, sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like that movement code, I'm still not sure I understand it. But it works beautifully. And having tried to code these kind of games myself and found that they don't work, I'm really impressed with this code. So the lesson here is um, if you're doing a game like this and you're, and you're not happy with your movement technique, find a game like this one and steal the code from it. Even if you don't 100% understand it, it um, will really get you, um, like, you don't have to make an entire game to learn about coding, right? And this is the glory and the fun of remixing stuff. Just grab the parts that you understand and change those. Other parts that you don't understand, just go ahead and, um, and steal someone else's code for now. And after you get more experienced, it'll all make sense to you as time goes on, right? Um, okay, guys, I'm going to log off for today. I had a lot of fun teaching you this, and I said things went quite well, surprisingly enough. So thank you, Thane, for noticing. Um, I'm going to be back again next week with the rest of this game. And in the meantime, I, um, I'm going to continue working on some other stuff. We're going to see if we can get a floor is lava version of Doodle Jump working. That sounds like a fun idea. Woohoo! Woo okay, guys, so we will see you next week. Nice uh, seeing you again. Bye.